My friend Cheryl is nuts. Cheryl is a former stripper turned born again Christian of the Rock Church tribe. She's a petite blonde woman, but her killer rack, uproarious laugh, and her outrageous personality belie the word petite. Although she turned her back on a life of sin years before I met her, Cheryl made the transition to Christian woman without changing her wardrobe, her sense of humor, or her mouth. When Cheryl swears, the Red Sea is parted and foul-mouthed angels sing from on high. The contrast between her professed Christian ways and her vestigial sinner's lifestyle was fascinating to me. <laughs> Upon learning that I was into dudes, she patted my arm, crestfallen. What's the matter, I asked. Oh, Steeler, she said, using her affectionate nickname for me. It's such a waste. I fucking love you, and I just don't want you to burn. <laughs> I learned over time not to take these proclamations personally. We might be separated in the afterlife, but in this one we were bound by laughter. Cheryl was a product of her upbringing, and I couldn't hold it against her. Her family was old Rhode Island, and Cheryl and her siblings grew up around the funeral home they operated out of the basement. This contributed to the crass sense of humor they all shared, and I delighted in it. Cheryl recalled to me once that at age 10, she woke up to a screaming match between her mother and father in the middle of the night. When Cheryl came out of the room, teddy bear in tow to see what the noise was, her father relented momentarily. Go back to bed, sweetheart. I'm gonna drag your mother down to the basement and embalm this cunt alive. Her siblings were no less colorful. Cheryl's brother Steve would frequently call her at work and it took superior linguistic skills to decipher his thick accent. Somehow I always seemed to pick up when he called. Is Cher there? Who? Cher. Who's Cher? Cher, my sister Cher, my fucking sister Cher. Is she there? Though she was devout, Cheryl was given hilarious expressions of her faith, subtly tinged with her special Rhode Island stripper flavor. She once found a huge holiday gift bag in the bathroom at work. When she seemed intent on keeping it and making no attempt to look at the true owner, I admonished her to consider the moral implications of her decision. Cheryl, what would Jesus do? <laughs> her face fell momentarily, then she looked up. Well, Jesus would probably find out who it belonged to and hand deliver this shit. No matter how long it took or how far away they lived, but any other motherfucker would keep it, and that's what the fuck I'm gonna do. <laughs> it was in the same great area that our friendship existed. She was sure I was going to hell, but she loved me anyway. I was judged by her, but I loved her anyway. We struck the unsteady piece of family. As a part of this family, I adopted Cheryl's daughter, Brittany. Equally as beautiful as her mother and just as deadly, Brittany was a fiery, hilarious young woman that often accompanied her mother to work after Cheryl's divorce. Brittany would frequently reduce me to a laughing, snotty mess by calling people by their most obvious feature. Fucking hair! <laughs> she would say a dangerous volume as the boss's secretary walked past my office. To be fair, the woman had hair like a rusted Brillo pad and shouldn't be called out. <laughs> oh, teeth! <laughs> Brittany once proclaimed while perusing a People magazine. I peered over her shoulder to see her reading an article about actor Ethan Hawke. This never failed to make liquid squirt from my nose and bounce of shot by. Our shenanigans went on for a year or so until we hired Connie, a stout woman with a mild speech impediment and a Navy husband as gay as a rainbow gerbil. <laughs> Connie just was not getting it. When she discovered softcore gay porn in his things, she brought it in for our inspection. Your husband's a fucking cock smoker, Cheryl said, <laughs> laying down the hard truth. But Connie refuted the claims with the blithe ignorance of a dutiful, love-struck beard. These are just magazines about weightlifting, she said. <laughs> Cheryl rolled her eyes. Of course, when Connie came home early one day to discover her husband in her clothes, attempting auto-insertion of a dildo, she was equally intransigent. He's so crazy, she said. <laughs> yeah, crazy queer, Cheryl said. I love Daryl, but he's gay, Connie. Quit tripping. I agreed. Connie, you came home from work and your husband was in your clothes, bent over and pooched up like a stink bug. Give it up. <laughs> but Connie had her own kind of faith and it was in shape. <laughs> Connie and Dildo Daryl had two daughters. <laughs> One of them was a teenager like Brittany. As a benefit of her friendship, Connie offered free childcare and food. She cooked with so much salt that your fingers would swell after eating. I made some chicken and dumplings for you guys. 
she would declare proudly, carting an eight gallon crock pot to work with a saline enhanced smile on her face. We shut her, but we ate her food with faint smiles and nonverbal proclamations of delight. We called her the Spice Rack. <laughs> Spice Rack Connie heavily favored her infant daughter, leading the older girl, Autumn, to become an attention seeking wild child. Returning from lunch with Cheryl, Brittany, Wild Child, Autumn, and the Spice Rack, I took the girls back to work in my car. In the space of a five minute ride, Autumn managed to nearly cause an accident, take off her bra, and throw it at the car in the next lane. But she didn't account for wind speed, and the bra landed abortively on my own windshield. Autumn reached forward from the back seat to turn on the wipers. She and Brittany screamed with laughter as the ballistic undergarment slid back and forth across the glass, squeaking. It finally flung itself onto the side of the road where it likely remains, marring the natural beauty of the Kearney Mesa landscape. <laughs> One day, Cheryl and Brittany planned to go to Bible study, and Autumn pleaded with Cheryl to accompany them. But Cheryl was familiar with Autumn's antics, and she did not fuck around at church. Cheryl was on the prowl for a, Christ prowl for a Christian husband. As a member of the Rock Church, she was not bound to long and flattering potato sack dresses, birth control flats, and conservative updates. Cheryl rocked low-cut tops and high-cut skirts. She was an attractive woman, but she often despaired at the lack of hot-ass men with a love for Jesus. <laughs> when I would attempt to comfort her by assuring her of her beauty and magnetism, she would brush it off momentarily. I know you're just saying that, Steeler, but then sometimes I see someone who looks like a straight-up creature, and then I look in the mirror and I see what the good Lord gave me and I say to myself, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Cheryl and her church-going girlfriend attended The Rock at least once a week and arrived early to sit in the front rows of the service. The preacher is so fine, Steeler, she told me. His wife is a beast, too. I don't get why his fine ass is with that fucking creature. She hoped to catch his attention or at least, as she put it, some of that hot sweat he gets to flinging everywhere when he gets carried away with the spirit. So she wasn't about to have a wild child Autumn screwing up her game with riotous teenage antics. But Autumn baked, pulling on Cheryl's leg like a toddler with borderline personality disorder, and swore her best behavior. Cheryl relented. All right, Tripper, she told Autumn, on one condition. If you do anything to embarrass me, and I mean anything, I'll have your mom beat your ass with that wooden spoon. Autumn lived in mortal Pavlovian fear of the spoon. <laughs> Spice Rock Connie was only happy to oblige. Hell yeah, I'll beat her ass, Spice Rock Connie said, <laughs> enthusiastically nodding her head. She brandished the spoon and wild child Autumn with speech impeded mess. The deal was struck. Cheryl, Brittany, and Autumn made their way out of the house and into the car to head to Bible study. But we'll be on our best behavior didn't last long. Despite Autumn's firm assurances, she and Brittany began to work each other into a giggling frenzy. I'm not fucking with you two little derelicts. Cheryl admonished from the driver's seat as they pulled into a space. The girls swore to Cheryl they'd get it out of their system before entering the Bible study, but Cheryl was unconvinced. She pointed a finger at Wild Child Autumn as they walked into the hall and threatened her foot. Just beat your ass, Cheryl said. <laughs> this only caused the girls to stifle another bout of irreverent and uncontrollable giggles. The three of them found seats in a front row and turned to watch the other members file into the church. Cheryl became ever more agitated by the girl's barely controlled laughter as Call It Out Brittany did what she did best, vocally identifying people based on their most obvious feature. The Rock is a very modern church which provides something that the new Christians are hungry for, a range of expression and lifestyle which is either unwelcome or unfamiliar to more traditional churches. What's that? Christian rap? You got it. We be subbing for Jesus. The message of Christ Rock and roll style? Here, wear this t-shirt emblazoned with the slogan, Forgiven, surrounded by silver and gold fleur-de-lis and edgy splatters. <laughs> the Rock Church didn't require you to wear a suit or a long dress to fit in. On this day, it made it possible for a large woman of color rocking a rainbow moo-moo and sparkly purple boots to roll into the church hall with, as Cheryl puts it, no shame in the game. <laughs> Any restraint Brittany had struggled to maintain up to this moment evaporated. Upon seeing this tropically clad congregate, Brittany yelled, What's up, boobs in the house? <laughs> Wild Child Autumn immediately fell out of her seat and rolled into the middle of the aisle, laughing and seizing like an epileptic in the middle of a grandma seizure. Congregants had to step around her to make their way down the aisle. Cheryl paled with horror and embarrassment and then red with anger. You little maggots, she hissed. Get out of here! 
Go sit in my car and wait for me and don't get out of it for any reason, she demanded. The heavens split with the thunder of her maternal fury. Autumn, I swear to God, if you leave that car, I'll kill you your fucking self. Ain't gonna need your mom to beat your ass with that spoon, because I'll have thrown your fucking country ass in a hole on the side of the road. Get out. <laughs> Brittany and Autumn protested, but Cheryl silenced them with a terrible glare. The girls took the keys and left the hall, still giggling. When Cheryl had completed Bible study a couple of hours later, somewhat calmed by the wisdom she had imbibed among the tranquil consensus of her peers, she walked out to her car and opened the driver's side door ready for an uneventful trip home. The girls were sitting in the back seat, as commanded. A bottle of yellow liquid was lying in the front. Cheryl picked the bottle up. It was warm. <laughs> what the fuck is this, she seethed, as Autumn blubbered and Brittany began to laugh unrepentantly. Cheryl, I'm sorry, Autumn said. You said we had to sit in the car we couldn't leave for any reason. You little mutant. If you spilled one fucking drop of piss in my fucking car. No, Cheryl, I didn't, Autumn pr protested frantically. I swear to God I didn't spill a drop. The bottle suction cup to my lips. <laughs> <laughs> Remarkably on our lips. Spice Rack may have broken the spoon in her incorrigible ass that afternoon, but she survived. She moved to Florida, got married, and has children of her own. God help her. <laughs> Call it out, Brittany is building a life for herself, and I am honored to have the pleasure of seeing her grow into the beautiful young woman I always knew she would be. And Cheryl found what she was looking for, a good man who loves her and treats her right. She's happy and still hilarious. She still thinks I'm going to hell, but that's okay with me. I love her and Brittany both like they're my own family. They taught me how to laugh at darkness. And they taught me that sometimes family can't give you acceptance. They may want to, but... Baby Jesus and hip-hop pastors ruined some of our best laid plans. <laughs> Sometimes our families can't offer acceptance. Just their affection and a few laughs. Sometimes that's enough. <laughs>